In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. I know, Pepper, we'll get to that soon. Today, we remember St. Francis and St. Clair. We give thanks for the ways they embodied freedom and delight, trusting in God, our Creator, the one who, in the very beginning, envisioned a flourishing world, a planet interconnected in its life forms, each living being interdependent. Yes, the maker of heaven and earth places us among all living things. And it's our job to figure out our right size, a small part of God's larger whole. Francis and Claire knew that this was a dignifying kind of humility, where we are invited to belong, to be part of tending this beautiful planet that God so fiercely loves. And the power of that mystery changed Claire and Francis's lives. It touches us too. We, we feel it whenever we gaze out at the ocean and feel ourselves so very small as we look out on the horizon. We feel it dwarfed as we hike among those majestic towering redwoods. And we feel its magnifying tenderness and trust whenever we're snuggled up next to those soft, warm bodies of our pets, some of them here in the room today. I'm so glad you brought them. Yes, we are invited to know the grace all creatures are made to share in these connections that God blessed and that we too will bless as we gather after the service in the garden. Now today's Gospel of Luke is mostly what stands between us and those treats, those cookies for our pets, and it does kind of pose a little bit of a, a stopping moment, right, for us to reflect and consider, even though it doesn't talk about animals specifically, but it does show us this challenge that all human beings have to figure out what that just right size is as we consider the whole of God's universe. The man in Jesus' parable does pay the ultimate price as he grapples with that human dilemma. And like so many of Jesus' parables, there are lots of layers of meaning. We're not going to talk about all of them, but there is one thing I'd like us to consider this morning, because I think it shows us there are high stakes as we work on cracking that nut about what our right size is in the universe. There is a clarion call here to live simply and to realize that we don't have all the time in the world, in fact. Right? That man, the very next day after he was sketching out his plans, his life came to a conclusion. He didn't fail to look outward. He just failed to see in the grand scheme of time that we don't always know how to steward our footprint. God's abundance is the source of all abundance in our lives. And this man didn't quite figure out how to be a channel to spread those resources in life-giving ways, ways that God might have desired. He didn't catch on to that invitation to live simply, and it was a costly mistake. This weekend was our second semi-annual rummage sale in 2024, and if you were a part of the efforts here, I just want to say thank you. We could give a big round of applause. If you have never been part of this wondrous whirlwind, or maybe if you resist that glorious tidal wave because it feels just a little too magnificent, it's okay. This experience, this extravaganza that we have come to offer up as a container to encounter one another and our neighbors in life-giving ways, it is something that's overwhelming and takes my breath away. But I did talk to the treasurer who counted up all the earnings this morning. And she said this may be, I, I can't give the official number, I'll let her do that, but this may be the biggest uh, net yet, which is fabulous. This, 
if you know, this isn't just about our love affair with stuff. Uh, it is about supporting the essential work of ministry, not only here at St. Paul's, but in partnerships that we share with organizations in San Mateo County that turn outward and look to, to share God's abundance with our neighbors. So this is a key part of how we do outreach at St. Paul's. And I also see in this practice, for all of the minutia and the whirlwind and the energy and the stuff that's still out in the Occidental parking lot, if you care, you are welcome to explore those treasures that still remain ripe for the picking. I think it's about practicing right-sized relationships and touching on this simplicity that God wants us to know, that the joy and delight we were created to participate in, it's right here, right on our very doorsteps, and stuck, tucked away in those closets and cupboards and garages. Simplicity is so refreshing. And we feel it when we transform these spaces of our church property to encounter our neighbors, and these spaces between human hearts we are opened up as a channel for grace in ways that we cannot even comprehend. I had some pretty holy conversations yesterday that blew my socks off. People sharing about how God is present with them as they walk with their loved ones to the other side, as they encounter opportunities to be of service in the world. These folks who come, they aren't just members of St. Paul's. They are people who join from other faith communities and other circles of connection because they want to be part of that sharing of grace, that tidal wave of love that sweeps through us and helps us feel that simplicity in our hearts. Yesterday, I overheard some people talking about the relief efforts that have been extended in the southeastern United States in the aftermath of Hurricane Helene. And people were marveling that, yes, it is once again the animals who are saving our lives, helping deliver supplies and rescue victims that are trapped in the mountains of western North Carolina. And later, yesterday, I was in another conversation where people were chatting about where they would like to travel given the opportunity. And one individual, she, she in the midst of that conversation, she shared her own principled commitment to travel only to those places that she could reach driving her electric vehicle. That's how committed she is to, to paying attention to her carbon footprint. And she didn't feel robbed of any joy choosing to abstain from transatlantic flights, taking her off to foreign places. She was celebrating the beauty of Carmel and the oceans and the mountains that are right here practically on our doorstep. There are so many ways our world is interconnected, ways we might overlook at first glance. But something that we are seeing more and more are that the rising temperature of our global oceans, they're continuing to raise the average surface temperature of the Earth. And this is having tremendous impact, not just in far off lands, but right here in our own country. That extra heat is making the regional seasonal temperatures more and more extreme. There's less snow cover. There is melting sea ice, intensifying rainfalls that are devastating parts of our own habitats. This doesn't just affect us, it affects the plants and the animals that God placed us here on the planet to take care of too. I have a friend who works for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and he tracks statistics about how land areas are warming faster than the ocean areas, in fact. And the data reveal that the rate of warming in these past three decades is significantly faster than that average increase since the start of the 20th century. This is an accelerating crisis, and it is on our doorsteps. This sobering news for all of us. There were more than 215 people who lost their life in Helene. There are many more creatures, people and animals, waiting for help still. And I give thanks for the disaster response teams, including those gentle mule friends of ours who just like in the olden times, are again being called upon 
to bear us on their backs. Yes, our faith invites us to be transformed by living simply. And if you, like me, love that shaker tune that sings about simple gifts, you probably are working on that already in your own lives. We are connected to one another and to this wider world that God so loves, and the impact of our choices reach far beyond we, what we may recognize. Yes, personal habits and ways of being are good places to start, but we also need to begin to look to those global patterns in a society that is increasingly interconnected, including in our systems of abuse that degrade and destroy our planet. Each and every one of us has different ways, different spheres of influence where we can touch this crucial dilemma. And I believe that these prayers we've been praying in the season of creation are opening up our hearts. The ecumenical leaders in God's wider church, they took time to frame this issue as one of vital concern to our God. And in our confession that we'll pray in just a few moments, I wonder if we might reflect on humanity's role in our climate crisis. Because the confession isn't just about the things we do, they are about the things that are done on our behalf. In that confession, we repent of the ways that we have fallen short, our leaders, our governments, our countries, our communities, in this sacred call to be caretakers of God's creation. And we turn again back to the God who invites us to a vision of wholeness and flourishing for all life on the planet. If you know the poet Pedrig Otuma, I really enjoy his blog, and he had a provocative question in, in, that he wrote about this week. We started with the poetry of Job and the song of creation, and I want to end with the reflections of a poet. He asks a question that I think is important. He says, how can we speak at a time like this? And then, like all poets, he posits his own answer. He says, it's probably the only hope we have to speak like this at a time like this, to dare to exhibit the freedoms we know our future needs, to make speech acts that acknowledge disparity of power and rights, to make speech acts that call the self-reflection that the future requires into the moment of today. Otuma went on to say, and I agree with him, I'd like to live in a world where the most powerful take that on first. That self-reflection, that acknowledgement of the disparities of power. He also says, we don't yet live in that world. And like Otuma, I also want to be part of making that world manifest among us. He says, the ecosystem of a more just future will mean many things. Some will protest, some will negotiate, some will analyze, some will propose, some will strategize, some will fund, most will lament, most will support others, some will critique all necessary. But his final sentence, I think, is the most important. What is also necessary is that we don't destroy each other along the way. Francis was concerned about this, too, way back in the day, when he began performing those prophetic speech acts, taking the silk of his father's business and throwing it out the window in Florence as a prophetic expression that this resource needed to be spread throughout God's creation to heal those disparities and to ensure the flourishing of human beings and creatures together. And yes, his life was one of radical simplicity. I can't walk the path that he did, but I do notice that in turning from the lavish life that he led before and seeking to repair the world, working with lepers, rebuilding, literally moving stones with his own body to repair old churches, and establishing a monastic order that drew many young people into its orbit because of the radical commitment to Jesus Christ that they witnessed in Francis and Claire's life. 
These were all prophetic ways in which Francis lived out his faith. I think we can be encouraged and strengthened as we consider our own spheres of influence and take stock of those spaces and relationships that are bursting with abundance in our lives. We have the power to channel that grace and to invite people to know the joy of God's saving love, drawing us into lives of simplicity. May we follow courageously our Lord and Savior, just like Claire and Francis did. May we know that delight that flows from trusting in the provision of our Maker. May we be blessed to flourish together with every being that lives. Amen.